good morning. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Pastor Greg. I'm one of the pastors here, and um, it's my privilege to bring you the word this morning uh, in relief of Pastor Dave, who's off uh, officiating a wedding. So um, you're stuck with me. And by the way, um, paper doesn't have batteries or need the internet, so... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I spent last week uh, at camp in the mountains with, with many of our brothers and sisters from Heritage, and one of the things that I really enjoyed uh, was getting up early and going outside to, to read and pray and, and experience nature. I was usually one of the first ones out there, and I won't lie, I was usually out after the sun came up. It wasn't before the sunrise, partly because the sun rises so early this time of year and partly because I was tired. But um, <clears throat> the feel of being out there was very much like what happens before the sun rises. It was quiet and still and everything and everyone had, had yet to wake up. It took a while before even the, uh, the energetic and prolific hummingbirds got going. Then as the sun got brighter, the hustle and bustle of the activity in the camp began to grow as, as sleepy kids and adults started making their way out of their cabins ready for that bell to ring so that we could eat breakfast. The birds were chirping, the hummingbirds were going crazy, everything was waking up. Our passage this morning is about what happens before the sunrise. It's about what happens before the dawn of a new day. Luke chapter 1 verses 57 through 80, which our brother read, is about the birth of John the Baptist and the coming Messiah. This was anything but ordinary. The Lord sends John the Baptist to prepare the way to the signal that promised that the day had arrived, the day of new covenant salvation. And so John's birth and John's ministry say to people, wake up, it's time to greet the Savior. It's time for the day of salvation. This is momentous. It, it signals God's sovereign hand in the affairs of humanity and his command over history and specifically redemptive history. The events in, in these verses should cause awe and amazement and rejoicing. Indeed, this is often a, a Christmas passage. But we, ought, we easily forget that God's intervention in history and in our own lives uh, to draw us to himself in saving faith is, is no less awe-inspiring and full of wonder and, and mercy and grace. And as we'll see, God's visitation in our personal lives could also be described in this vivid imagery of the rising sun as we're rescued out of the domain of darkness to serve him in holiness and righteousness. Again, the, the magnitude and glory of what's happening in this passage can't be overstated. As you turn to Luke uh, chapter 1, verses 57 through 80, if you're not already there, let, let me refresh our memories a bit as to far as where we are. It's no accident that the events surrounding the birth of John, who becomes the Baptist, and the birth of, of Jesus, who is the Lord, are so intimately intertwined. As we see that John is indeed the forerunner, the beginning of the dawning of the new day that points to Christ. Next, we'll see that uh, we, we have previously been introduced to the priest Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, who were childless and advanced in years back in verse 7. At, at this time, Zechariah was, was performing his priestly d duty in the temple, verses 11 through 23. We learn of an announcement by the angel Gabriel to Zechariah concerning the miraculous 
conception of a son. What we saw there was Zechariah's skepticism and, and really lack of faith uh, that, that earned him the discipline of God, which, uh, as Pastor Dave uh, joyfully cracked up at, it was a period of being temporarily mute for, for nine months till the baby was born. Elizabeth conceived, and, and after this, she hid herself away for five months. And then in the following verses, uh, verses 26 through 38, Gabriel visits Mary and informs her of her un upcoming conception. She responded in faith and awe at the significance of the whole event, even though she didn't know or understand how God was going to work it all out. And then next we see Mary visit Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is given divine insight by the Holy Spirit as her baby leaps for joy in the womb. The baby that would be, will be born in our passage this morning. Uh, and he, he leaps for joy at the grace and mercy that God is pouring out upon Mary as she carries the Lord in her womb. The reason is that even from within the womb, John recognizes the dawning of this new day, the dawning of a new creation in Jesus. In that passage, Mary then bursts into praise to the Lord for the work that he's doing. She leaves after three months, and that brings us to the passage this morning where we return to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Here we see that God's promises cannot fail, and with the birth of John, we see the precise progression of his plan of redemption. The New Testament age of salvation is dawning. Zechariah's faith and the Holy Spirit enable him prophetic insight into the significance of his son's birth, God fulfills the promises to Abraham and, and visits Israel to bring salvation through the coming Davidic Messiah. And John, again, will, will be his forerunner. So we see the main point for us today, and if you have your handout, it's on the handout. It's to entrust your life confidently to God as he is causing his plan of salvation or his plan of redemption to come to pass with precision. And as we open this passage, we see three distinct segments through which we can see three aspects of God's character. Now, I'm not going to read the passage again because it's very long and we're already having a long service today. So um, I'll go through all the verses. But first, we see that God is sovereign in the birth and naming of John in verses 57 through 60. And then in verses... Uh, 67 through 79, we see that God is faithful in Zechariah's psalm of praise. And then finally, we see that God is providential as Luke looks forward into the life of John in verse 80. So God is sovereign, God is faithful, and God is providential. Look with me at verses 57 and 58. God is sovereign in the birth and naming of John. There it says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. So here we see that almost immediately after Mary returned home, it was time for Elizabeth to give birth. Remember, she had hidden herself and Zechariah, of course, was unable to speak. Elizabeth would have been an older woman past the typical age of childbearing. Surely her pregnancy and the birth of the child would have caught her neighbors and relatives off guard. There would have been no baby shower beforehand, no Amazon gift registry, no hand-me-down clothes in storage, just a baby. So here we see mostly the, the reaction of the relatives and neighbors to the birth. They react appropriately. 
They see the great mercy that God has shown Elizabeth in granting her a child when it was otherwise humanly impossible, which that's the point is that it's humanly impossible with, God, with people, but with God, everything is possible. The word translated here as shown in shown her great mercy is the same word that Mary used back in verse 46 where she exclaimed, my soul magnifies the Lord. So what God was doing here was God had magnified his mercy in Elizabeth here. As friends and relatives of a priest and those who knew their scriptures, they all knew that the Lord can do great things beyond what we expect. They've read about Abraham and Sarah and, and all of the Old Testament miracles that occurred there. And then we see also that their joy, they rejoiced with Elizabeth is a fulfillment of the angel Gabriel's prediction in ver back in verse 14, which said, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. While we see God's sovereignty in the birth of the baby, we also see his sovereignty in the naming of him, which is exactly why what we would think would be a, an otherwise silly interaction to occur, right? The, the naming of a birth of a baby um, and, and the argument that kind of ensues, uh, that is exactly why it's included in, in Holy Scripture. We see his sovereignty in the naming of the baby as well as his sovereignty over Zechariah's stopped mouth in verses 59 through 64, which read, and on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to the father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote his, wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. So initially, from the earlier encounter with Zechariah uh, that, that he had with Gabriel, he had little understanding of just how much, God, how much power God had, had even in this seemingly insignificant task of naming a child. He had no ability to see or hear God's voice and will in the matter, and therefore he didn't have any ability to speak for nine months, which was struck upon him by God. He had deeply trusted or doubted God's promise that he made through the angel. But all that suddenly changed. Family and friends are coming together and on the eighth day following the child's birth, they were there to circumcise the child in accordance with the law of Moses and to name him, which was a sometimes Jewish custom to, to name the child at the time of, of his circumcision. Everybody just assumes or supposes that he would be called Ben Zachariah after his father, right? And... and uh, incidentally, Zechariah means God remembers. Names, as we know, were important in biblical times. Where Zechariah's faith had failed, Elizabeth seems to have trusted the promise of, of Gabriel from the, the moment that Zechariah would have communicated to the, this to her. She immediately and matter-of-factly says to them, no. He shall be called John in verse 60. And then we have this kind of uh, family feud erupt. Kind of, but Elizabeth, there's no Johns in your family. Don't you want Zechariah Jr.? So the family trait of priesthood can be handed down. You know, Zechariah and sons or Zechariah and Zechariah Jr. kind of thing. Elizabeth, in trusting God at his word, 
was steadfast in the face of the expectation around her, she steadfastly held to, no, he shall be called John. And that, that brings up a question. Do you live in light of God's truth and not in light of what others around you expect? Back to the text. And they, and they turn to Zechariah, making signs to him like one would do with a deaf man. And it's, it's interesting reading the commentators. There's like pages and pages of, of back and forth over whether Zechariah was deaf as well as mute because of them making signs. And I don't really think he was deaf at all because, A, the text only says he was mute. I think they just assumed he might have been deaf deaf because he wasn't talking. So Zechariah signals to them to give him a writing tablet, which, by the way, all the commentators agree that this was not, in fact, an iPad, but was probably a little tablet that was covered in wax on which he would scratch out words. It's kind of similar to when I was a kid. We had those little tablets that had, were wax, and they had a little thing that you flipped up. Most of you probably don't really know because I'm old, but anyway. Um, so Zechariah confirms in writing what his wife had already said. He said, his name is John. He didn't say, no, his name will be John, but his name is John. And at this, they all wondered, or in the LSB, it says they all marveled. Most likely they wondered or marveled at this point at the, at the firmness and the agreement that uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth had in naming the boy John and bucking the tradition of naming him after a family member. Their wonder would soon turn to fear and even astonishment. As we look at this, too, we see that God's discipline of Zechariah's initial unbelief had its intended effect. He was no longer arguing. He was no longer doubting. He was, he was now conforming to God's will and God's purpose. And now he writes the name with full conviction onto that little tablet. And immediately it says, the Lord loosed his tongue. He restored his speech. And immediately, the first thing that comes out of Zechariah's mouth is the blessing of God in verse 64. I think we could just easily skip right over the, that, but I think we should reflect on this, right? A man in the priestly service of God is disciplined because he didn't trust the word of the Lord by the angel Gabriel. That discipline brought much perspective to Zechariah and not just perspective but deep and reverential praise think about what valuable lessons Zechariah must have learned and and what valuable lessons that we should learn as we go through seasons of of struggle and suffering and humiliation it's often really easy to trust God when everything is going great but how about in times of trial? Are, are you preparing now to deal with the trial in a way that glorifies God? Here we see that that must be what Zechariah did. In his afflicted state, he had learned to trust God with renewed energy. God often works in adversity to build us up to grow us in grace, to help us to have our faith strengthened. This is what happened with Zechariah. In nine months of silence, while Elizabeth was pregnant with John, Zechariah was made silent to give him the opportunity to repent and to turn back to God. Which brings up another question for us. When, when you sin... Are you quick to turn to God, confessing your sins and repenting? 
God is faithful and just to, to forgive you, and then he'll use you for his glory. So even more than this, Zechariah now understood that God's plan was far bigger and majestic than he, he most likely thought. God was sovereign over John. He was sovereign over his birth. He was sovereign over his naming. He was sovereign over what he would do. As R.C. Sproul writes of this, it's like God, it was like it saying, your baby belongs to God. His name will be given by God himself. God has decreed his name shall be John, end quote. And then further, this comes full circle and goes back to the promise given by Gabriel in verse 13, where it said, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. Many of you who have relatives or are named John, the name means God has been gracious. Indeed, we will see how gracious he is. So after Zechariah speaks or begins to speak, the expectation in the crowd, which it doesn't say how many people are there, there were family and neighbors there, um, grows even higher. It's as though Zechariah's blessing of God was interrupted by their reaction from in verses 65 and 66, where it says there, and fear came on all, the na all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord is with him. The neighbors knew that this wasn't an ordinary birth. They knew something was different that was happening here. The birth, the unusual way the baby was named, and, and Zechariah's return speech produced fear. They knew that the Lord was with John and that the presence of the Lord elicited fear from the crowd. We see this throughout Scripture um, many times when the Lord is near, uh, there's, there's fear. And, and we see this even just with Zechariah and Mary in, in the preceding passages. Zechariah in verse 12 and Mary in verse 29. They, it says they were afraid. They, they feared. Then the fear that the neighbors expressed or experienced led them to discussion. Right, this, they would have been um, there around, and, and the gossip grapevine warped up, and people started talking. Right, um, they they also maybe perhaps thought that that John was the Messiah, which we see later that there's question on whether John is the Messiah. After all, the Jews had expected deliverance through a savior from the earliest times. God, ha God has been silent for many years up until this point, but had started speaking and working on behalf of his people Israel. All these things that they heard and saw concerning the events of John's birth, the people then laid them up in their hearts. That is, they took them to heart. They had a strong reaction to the things that they heard and saw. They were greatly impacted by them. Another thing to notice here is that this is the, the hill country of Judea. They're out in the sticks, right? This would have been like if you're down in Los Lunas or something, and, and uh, it wasn't to the, the religious elite in the temple courts that this announcement came, but it was to the humble and the the people just out in the, in the country that this announcement of the nearness of Messiah's appearance is made. And think about this. This is a prototype of the ministry of John and Jesus themselves, right? Jesus didn't come to, to save the, the well or the righteous, but to, to the sick, 
to the sinners, to those who knew they are sinners. So here in this interaction, we've seen God's sovereignty as well as his mercy and grace in the circumstances that surrounded the birth and naming of the baby. This should be great cause for you to entrust your life confidently to God as he is causing his plan of redemption to come to pass with precision. It should strengthen your faith and deepen your worship and love to God. This brings us to the second point. God is faithful. The response to the question, what then will this child be, begins with flowing praise for God, enabled by God. Verse 67, and his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, So once Zechariah's tongue was loosed, God used him in a mighty way. He goes from nine months of dead silence to overflowing praise. And when his silence breaks, he, along with Elizabeth and Mary earlier, God is breaking around 400 years of silence from his prophetic word, which had not occurred since the book of Malachi. If we, it, we could, every one of these little points you could camp out and do a whole sermon on, but I can only kind of touch on brief things here. Um, <clears throat> in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would fill someone, come upon them to be used for God's service in a certain way. Many times it would stay on them, many times, or he would stay on them, many times he would be removed. We can see that in, in many passages like Numbers 11.25 where it says there the Holy Spirit rested on the 70 elders as, and they prophesied. But here Zechariah's words are called a prophecy or even a psalm. This, this passage here is often referred to as the Benedictus after the Latin for what is translated in English as blessed in verse 67. One commentator says this about the entire prophecy. What then will this child become? He declares what this child's birth reveals or about God's faithfulness to the promises made to Abraham and to David. But surprisingly, he also declares that it signals the advent of the Messiah to deliver Israel. End quote. The overarching theme of the entire Benedictus is God's unsurpassed faithfulness to himself and to his promises. Very significant here is that the entire prophecy is, is framed within the word visit at the beginning of verse 68 and again near the end in verse 68 or 78. It's the word I've, I've, uh, I've practiced saying this. Hopefully I won't butcher it. It's the Greek word episkopepsomai, which the word episcope is derived from, which means bishop or overseer. It's one of the words that's used of, a, of, of an elder, an overseer. But the word um, has a wide range of meanings depending on the context. It can confer God visiting people to punish, as in Psalm 89, verse 32. It can carry with it the meaning to look after, such as to tend to the sick, in, like in James 1, 27. But here in this context, where God is the, the subject and, the, and the, his people, specifically Israel, and then those who by faith are grafted in, the new covenant, uh, are the object, it means to look upon with favor or with mercy in, as in the eschatological sense, an end times sense. That's what the framing of this entire psalm of praise is from start to end. It's full of imagery and quotations that are direct or indirect uh, from, from the Old Testament. 
And an, another thing, it's very clear that John's ministry and message is going to be set in the unfolding plan of God's redemption. Zechariah isn't having this uh, brag on my child moment, right? He's, he's, he's not presenting his son as the next child prodigy. It's not, you know, the next Michael Jordan or the next Mozart. Zechariah recognizes that, that this is ultimately about God. It's ultimately about who God is and what he's doing. We see that he weaves a tapestry of praise to God in the coming work of the Messiah in verses 68 through 75, which, by the way, is one long sentence in the Greek. And then follows verses 76 through 79 that, that, are, act, that are prophecy concerning John and John's relationship to Jesus in redemptive history. So first we'll look at verses 68 through 75 in which Zechariah gives God praise for the coming work of Jesus and his ministry. And we can briefly see five aspects of the praise of God's Messiah that all find their foundation in the Old Testament. So in verses 68 and 69, we see salvation and redemption comes through the Davidic king. And then in verse 70, we see that this was promised by the Old Testament prophets. Verse 71 talks about being saved from enemies. And then verses 72 and 73, God's faithfulness to the Abrahamic covenant, all with a specific goal, which is service to God in holiness and righteousness in seven, verses 74 and 75. So Let's look at verse 68 and 69. There it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. <clears throat> Here we see God's faithfulness to his promises of salvation and redemption through the Davidic king. I and others have often said that Jesus and the gospel don't just occur in a vacuum. Or Jesus didn't just drop out of the sky and live and die and be resurrected, be resurrected untethered from anything else. No, this was God's plan A from the beginning. The gospel is firmly grounded in God and in the scriptures which should cause us much joy and much assurance in its truthfulness. Zechariah issues a blessing toward God that is strikingly reminiscent of many Old Testament benedictions. 1 Kings 148 comes to mind, uh, where it says that the king said there, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted someone to sit on my throne this day, my own eyes seeing it. And importantly, in that context, it occurred in the discussion of David's heir. Later in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon praised the Lord for making a house for David and raising him up, raising Solomon up as the initial heir to David's throne. Zechariah is here pointing to Christ as the ultimate fulfillment of this. God has visited or overseen or led his people. He's redeeming them through this king. He has bought them back from slavery. Ultimately, slavery to sin and death and hell. One thing to notice is that in all these verses, there's an intermingling of eternal promises with seemingly temporal promises. This is one reason the people were so confused when Jesus came on the scene, right? They expected this political and military king who would overthrow the Greeks and the Romans who were occupying Israel. They didn't recognize that the king came to redeem a people first. He came to deal with sin. Question not a question, but a comment, whether we know it or not, our biggest problem 
isn't a political one. Our biggest problem isn't a social problem. Our biggest problem isn't somebody or something or some institution out there. It's the sin that dwells in us. This is the sin that separates us from God. And the only way for us to justly deal with it is death. Our sin requires the shedding of blood. We could never atone for our own sin. Jesus, the ultimate son of David, the fulfillment of Abraham's covenant, who which we'll see, is the only one who can do that. He came and lived a perfectly righteous life before God in order that those who would come to entrust themselves to him would be his people through faith, first the Israelites and then those in the rest of the world. Here was the Davidic king dying in place of his people. Martin Lloyd-Jones Lloyd wrote, Our Lord did not come to tell us what we, need, we have to do in order to save ourselves. He came to save us. The Christian doctrine of salvation and redemption is this, that Christ himself is the salvation. End quote. If you are not yet a believer in Christ, I urge you that the only deliverer from your sin is Jesus. And I would urge you to believe upon him today. He will take his, your sin upon himself and give you his spotless righteousness. And you'll have peace with the holy God. Amen. He raised up a horn of salvation for his people in verse 69. In Psalm 18, verse 2, David re refers to this as he extols God there. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The term horn is, is a term of might and strength. I would encourage you to, to read Psalm 18 in its entirety on your own with Zechariah's prophecy kind of as the backdrop. So here we see that Zechariah recognizes the dawning of the messianic king is at hand in God's visitation. Next, we see that this is in accordance to the promises of the Old Testament prophets. Verse 70 as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, from of old. Later in Luke 24, verses 25 and 26, Jesus, after his resurrection, said to those on the road to Emmaus, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Zechariah's prophecy and John's forthcoming ministry set the context that would set the stage for understanding who Jesus is and for understanding what Jesus had come to do. This was the fulfillment of all of God's promises. This is the moment to which all of the Old Testament had looked in anticipation and expectation of what God would do in salvation. Time escapes us, but from Genesis 3.15 to the Old Testament sacrificial system to Jonah to the suffering servant of Isaiah to the conquering king of the book of Zechariah and everything in between pointed forward to Christ and his fulfilling of God's promises. Third, God is faithful in that Israel will be saved from their enemies. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Again, there's much uh, speculation or much commentary over this, uh, but I, this, this language is a reference back to Psalm 18. Um, both verse 3 and verse 17 refer to deliverance from enemies, as also does Psalm 106 verse 10 where it says, so he saved them from the hand of the foe and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. 
there is, there is a, a physical deliverance that is first in view, which will ultimately be fulfilled when Jesus returns and there will be no more enemies. He will, he will, um, he will, he will get rid, put all the enemies under his feet. And that's what, what Luke seems to have in view as the enemies, those who are opposed to the way of the Lord in the, and especially in the coming life and death and ministry of Jesus. This, again, opens salvation not only for the Jews, but for all who come to faith in, in him, even us, the Gentiles, which is because of this fourth point, God is faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. Verse 72 and 73. To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, which we'll look at what he grants us in the next section. So contained in this hymn, Zechariah reflects upon the fulfillment of prophecy, the prophecy given to Abraham. We find accounting of this in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and Genesis 17, verse 7, as well as chapter 22 and chapter 26. And again, in Deuteronomy 7, 8. Leon Morris comments here, the oath was a significant part of any covenant, and here it is emphasized. God will not go back on what he has sworn. The covenant with Abraham will be brought to its consummation. That's, end quote, and that's what Zechariah is looking at. Luke, Luke connects the dots for us by telling us that the coming of Jesus as Messiah into the world is fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Think about this. At the time that the promise was made, it was about, the, at this time, the time of Zechariah, the promise was about 2,000 years old already. So from our perspective, we're looking at 4,000 years ago. God's promise to Abraham was not made to the Jews alone, but to the world, to the nations, to the Gentiles. Abraham, you will be the father of many nations, right? John will help the world of his day and us to look to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is not about John, although he will be greatly used by God. And then finally here we see uh, maybe surprisingly, but su su extremely important, is the goal in, in all of this is service to him in holiness and righteousness in verses 74 and 75. That we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before all our days. The idea brought up in verse 71 about uh, enemies is restated and Bach writes of this Zechariah anticipates physical deliverance as part of messianic salvation such expectation belongs to the self salvific perspective of those who trust Messiah Luke will explain in his two volumes the gospel of Luke and Acts how this expectation works itself out. So I can't explain it all right now because Luke took two whole volumes to do it. So stay tuned. But this is all to the end that God's people will be free to serve him in holiness and righteousness. The idea that's expressed here is that God's people can serve him fearlessly our sins have been dealt with. Ultimately, the enemies of the gospel will be dealt with. This is why God has fulfilled the Davidic and Abrahamic covenants for his people. Here is a reason to entrust your life to God. He has defeated your enemies and fulfilled all of his promises. We are now free to serve him in holiness and righteousness. Our conscience has been cleansed 
by the blood of his sacrifice. Our guilt has been removed. The Savior came to enable his people to serve and worship him in the way that God rightly deserves. Question, do you walk in holiness and righteousness? Do you serve and worship God with a glad and rejoicing heart? I pray that you do. In verses 76 through 79, then, Zechariah shifts his focus slightly and directs his prophecy to the actual answer of the question uh, that, that was asked, what then will this child be? We can see four vital aspects about John and his preparatory ministry to Christ. So first in verse 76, he's a prophet and, a, and the forerunner. And then verse 77, he's a preacher. Verse 78, God's mercy is seen through Christ. And then verse 79, God brings light and peace through Christ. So verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Don't worry, I only have about 45 minutes left. So... <laughs> No, I, it gets quick, it quicker here. So. Um, so Zechariah speaks about things that his son will do in the future. I mean, his son is only eight days old, right, at this point. He's given, Zechariah is given inspired insight concerning his life's purpose and his, and his ministry. John will have the responsibility of preparing Israel for the coming of the Lord. He will be a prophet, a mouthpiece for the Most High God. He will, he will be the prophet and forerunner, the one who goes before the Savior. So how will he do this? Verse 77 tells us to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. John will be a preacher. He'll proclaim the knowledge of salvation to Israel that consists primarily of their sins being forgiven, right? A couple chapters later, we see this is exactly what he did. Chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. But it's more than just preaching repentance. His people needed a savior. You can't just repent without a savior, right? And verses 78 and 79, we see that the focus there shifts back to the savior, who, remember, he isn't even out of the womb yet. So this preparing that John does is part of God's mercy through Christ. Verse 78, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Here's the capstone of the passage. This is the second referen reference to God's visitation, which starts closing out the psalm. Don't miss the fact that it's God's mercy that is what the motivation is for him to save. Not them, not something good in themselves. It's God's mercy is the motivation. God's mercy should lead us to be merciful. God is, is a compassionate God. He's not some un interested far off deity who is is unconcerned with your life he's merciful question are you merciful to love others and to share the truth of the gospel and christ with them the metaphor here then changes from the horn of salvation the the one of strength to one of uh, a comparison of light and darkness, which we're familiar with. Uh, back to the sunrise. What, what does a sunrise do? It provides light. It dawns on a new day. 
Zechariah has, I think, Isaiah 9, 2 in mind. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. In other words, those who were fumbling around in the dark as good as dead now have the Savior and his forerunner. They, they have no reason to walk in ignorance and unrighteousness anymore. And then finally, the second half of verse 79, to guide our feet into the way of peace. To be reconciled to God through the gospel necessarily creates peace. God's way is the way of peace in a chaotic world. This is what the Savior has come for. Further, he will guide out of darkness into light and peace through his teaching and his example. In describing the, the unique position that John has in redemptive history, Bach puts it like this. He writes, For he will serve like a bright guiding light that takes the people out of the darkness and brings them into God's way. John will proclaim salvation, but only Jesus can take them into it. End quote. Zechariah closes his prophetic psalm of praise, demonstrating without a shadow of doubt that God is faithful. God is sovereign in the birth and naming of John, and God is shown to be, the, to be faithful in fulfilling his eternal purposes in Jesus in his, in his ministry and John and, and Jesus' lives and purposes. So quickly then, to wrap this up, uh, we see that God is also providential. Verse 80 gives a look forward says, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So here we see that what God has promised, he, he makes come to pass. We see two things from this verse. First, we see John's spiritual growth. He grew and became strong in spirit. Second, he was in the wilderness until he grew up and began his ministry. His physical separation was a, a picture of his separation from sin. Question, do you separate yourself from sin? Or do you run headlong into it? And then when you do sin, are you quick to put it to death and turn back to God? We know that John grew spiritually because of God's providential work in his life, because of the message of repentance and salvation that he ultimately preached. He, in fact, lost his life over it. His life in the wilderness indicated what his birth and naming did, that he was set apart for God, for God's purposes. We see God working in John to accomplish these purposes, even up to the point of his death. God is sovereign and in control of that. He is faithful and he's providential in working out all that he intends to accomplish. If you're a Christian, your faith rests upon the promises of God, and even more, it rests on the very character and nature of of the God of those promises. Entrust your life confidently to God as he is causing his plan of redemption to come to pass with precision. If you're a child of, if you're chi his child by faith in his son, the one in whom he fulfills all his good pr promises, he will keep and love you and work all the details out in your life for your good and for his glory. Rejoice and rest in his absolute faithfulness. Let us serve him in holiness and righteousness. He is worthy of our wholehearted devo devotion, our worship, and our praise. Let me 
pray quickly and then we will partake in communion. Oh God, your promises are beyond words. Lord, we cannot even fathom uh, the, the bedrock that our faith uh, rests upon. We have uh, complete assurance that your word will come to pass because uh, it has come to pass. You have been bringing your word to pass since you spoke creation into existence. Lord, help us to um, trust you more. Help us to rest in our Savior who is your son, who is fully man and fully God, who lived the, the life that we could not live, that redeems us from our sin, that uh, rescues us from all our enemies, that brings us into peace with him. You are um, sovereign, you are faithful, you are providential, and we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.